Hey folks, welcome to Eigen Designs. I'm your host, Mark, and in today's video, we're gonna be making a brick pattern cutting board out of some beautiful Paduk. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I polled my YouTube community to see if there'd be any interest in actually doing a giveaway for what I make on my channel. And about 78% of the people said that they would be interested. So what I'm gonna do in this video is not only make this board, but I'm gonna be giving this away. So later in this video, there's instructions on how you can enroll. So if you wanna see how I built it and how you can enter in to win this cutting board, then stay tuned and find out. Now that I've been making YouTube videos for almost a year, I've noticed a common pattern of questions that I get on my videos and it's usually from people who are trying to make what I'm doing in my videos and I don't provide enough detail up front on the design or the dimensions of how to do it. So I'm going to try to get ahead of that today by providing a lot more detail. For this design, we're going to be using some Padoop boards that are three and a half inches wide. The very end piece is going to be half of that at an inch and three quarter. More on that later. The maple mortar is going to be a quarter inch wide, and all of this is going to be an inch and three quarter tall. Now I'm going to fast forward here and actually show you how this pattern is going to fit together. And you see me here taking some dimensions for how much you need to have for exactly one cutting board. In this video, I actually used longer stock so I could make three cutting boards. So you see a lot of excess material on the back, but what I'm showing you right now is what you need for exactly one board. So now I take these strips and I turn them up on edge so the end grain is facing towards the ceiling. And you're about to see why having the end piece of Paduk at half the width is so important. So as you flip that board over, it allows you to have a staggered pattern which resembles more like what you'd see on a brick wall. Once all those pieces are in place, you can take some of your quarter inch maple that you're going to have in between to serve as the mortar. And as you fill in those gaps and push everything together, you're going to have that traditional brick pattern that's going to look so iconic. Alright, now that we've got the design figured out, it's time to get to work and do some milling. I start off by taking this Paduk and Maple and going over to my miter saw and cutting them to length. In this video, I actually started out with 40 inch length pieces because I'm making three boards at once. But if you're just looking to make a single board, you only need 13 inches of finished material at the end. So cut something or maybe a little bit longer than that to give you your final dimensions. Once I have all my pieces cut to length, I then run the face grain over the jointer to provide a nice straight edge. And then I use that straight edge as a reference against the fence to put a nice 90 degree edge on the edge grain. Before running the boards through the planer, I make some light pencil marks on the face grain as a reference so that I know when I can stop planing each of the boards. I'm going to try to leave these boards as thick as possible to save material. Now that the boards have been jointed and planed, it's time to rip them to final width. Now I normally have a combination blade on my saw stop because it's good at cross cuts and it's good at ripping, but it's not great at either. So if I'm going to be doing a lot of rip cuts, especially for hardwoods, I will swap out to a dedicated rip blade that has a lower tooth count. This one has a 24 tooth count and it's much better for ripping cuts with the grain. So I take the time here to swap out the blade and I do that because not only will it cut more efficiently, but it actually leaves behind a smoother cut because while you're cutting with the grain, you don't want the high tooth count of a cross-cut blade or even a combination blade. With the rip blade installed, I set my saw to the right height 
and then I set my fence to three and a half inches and then I go to work. Once all the long rip cuts are done, I turn my attention to the maple mortar strips that are going to be used in the third glue up. This may not make sense now, but it'll make more sense as I do the glue up and actually rip these into strips. So if you're not following why I'm doing this, stay tuned and it might make more sense in just a little bit. To make this brick pattern cutting board, there's going to be a total of three glue ups. This is the first of those three. And for this first panel glue up, I'm going to do it in two smaller sections rather than doing it all at once. The reason for that is both of the smaller sections will still be narrow enough to fit through my planer, which really simplifies the glue cleanup and expedites this process overall. While waiting for the panels to dry, I turn my attention to the maple blocks that are going to create the mortar that I referenced earlier. Now, I'm almost out of clamps at this point, so I had to use my longer Harbor Freight bar clamps, but they'll do the job just fine. Once the panels have had enough time to dry, I run each one of them through the planer a couple of times on both sides just to take off enough material to provide a flat, glue-free surface for the next glue up. Once both panels have been through the planer, it's time to complete the glue up and make one large panel. I follow a similar gluing process as before, but this time I'm taking extra care when applying the clamping pressure to make sure that the panels don't start bowing in the middle. If you see this happening or you're concerned about it, you can apply some calls on either end to apply a little bit of vertical pressure just to make sure that those panels remain flat as you apply the pressure. After a couple of hours, I take the panel out of the clamp, lift it on its side, and use a straight edge to remove any remaining glue on the underside before it completely hardens. This is an optional step of course, but I find that it just helps keep the glue from hardening and then introducing some wobble into your boards as you're working on them later. Before moving on to the next step, I swap out my rip blade for the combination blade, given that we've got a lot of cross cuts ahead of us in the next step. Next, it's time to cut the panel into individual strips using the crosscut sled. I set the stop block on my crosscut sled to one and three quarter inches and rip the panel until all the pieces are cut. The crosscut sled is one of those really nice to have tools around the shop and they're really easy to make. If you don't already have one, I'll leave a link to the one that I've got here in the description below if you want to check it out, but it makes really quick work of a project like this.
With all the strips cut, it's now time to make one more trip to the jointer and the planer just to make sure that the mating surfaces are going to be perfectly straight and parallel, which will make the glue seams invisible upon final glue up. Next, I turn my attention to the maple quarter inch mortar boards that are going to go in between each of the Paduk strips that we just finished ripping. To do this, I rip the maple into one and three quarter inch strips, which is going to give it the exact same height as the Paduk strips that we just cut. Once you have that set as the height, we're going to cut quarter inch strips from that, which is going to give us the mortar that we're looking for in the next step. I use a micro jig to help push this safely through the saw blade. So while I'm doing the last glue up, let me share some details of how to actually enter to win this cutting board. It's pretty simple. All you have to do is comment on this video and start your comment with the word enter, but I know that you're interested in actually entering the competition. Couple of rules for this. You have to be a subscriber to win. I'm going to pick and announce the winner on January 1st, 2022. Uh, the winner will have the board shipped to them free of charge. And this contest is open to anyone located in a place where giveaways are legal. So this is a bit of an experiment, but if it all goes well, I might do more of these in the future. I've had a number of people reach out to me and ask questions about how I do the flattening and the juice groove using the CNC. So I'm going to go through a couple of steps here using the software, but you can skip ahead if you're not interested. I basically start off by creating a rectangle with the exact dimensions of the as-built cutting board, and then I make an inner rectangle, usually offset by about an inch or so, to create the juice groove cutting path. Then I make an inner arc just to make it a little bit more decorative and connect it with some straight lines. And then once I've done that, I switch over to the CAM software, and the first thing I do is move the orientation point to the bottom left hand corner. Once that's done, the first step I'll do is select the entire area, do a 2D cutting path. Then I'll select a one inch surfacing bit. Uh, I've got a link to a white side bit that I really like in the description. And here you can see on the right side panel what some of the parameters are in terms of uh, maximum cutting depth, multiple step downs, uh, feed rate, RPM, all that stuff if you're interested to get into that level of detail. Once that's done, I then use the simulate feature to make sure that the cutting path is as expected, and then you can then post all that to G-Code and then upload it to your CNC. Now to create the juice groove, I select the inner rectangular profile that we created earlier, and I do a 2D contour path. For my juice grooves, I like to use a quarter inch round nose bit and I found a really nice one that doesn't leave any burn marks, which really helps simplify the sanding on the um, back end of things. Because if you've ever had to sand out burn marks on a juice groove, you know how long that takes. Uh, I've, again, I'm showing some of the parameters that I've chosen for the juice groove. But once you've got everything set up, again, I highly encourage you to check out the, uh, the simulation feature within the software, just so that you can make sure that you're not going to do anything that's going to cause any problems. Once you're happy with the toolpath and here everything looks fine, I again export it to G-Code and then uh, push it to the CNC. And now we are ready to start carving. With all the CNC work done, now it's time for the finishing touches to make this board come together. 
Now, this is a brand new toy that I had just picked up. This is the Festool Rotex 150. And I will eventually do a review on this tool once I've had a little bit more time to play with it. But uh, I'm really excited to put this to work. So I head over to my downdraft table and begin sanding all the way through the grit range that I normally would for a cutting board. I generally start off with 80 grit and then work my way up to 220. And I'll generally water pop between 180 and 220. Now for this particular board, I've elected to go with a tapered underside as opposed to traditional handles. So to cut those, I decide to get out my inclinometer and set my saw blade to 60 degrees to cut that tapered edge on all four sides of the cutting board. To make the cut, I line up the board so that the saw blade is going to cut about two thirds of the way up the side. Once you've cut one side, you can just flip the board over and replicate that exact cut. The complicated part comes in the next cut because what you're trying to do is made up the existing corner to that new edge. And if you do it just right, the line from both edges should come together and meet perfectly at the corner. With all four edges cut, I go back to the downdraft table and complete the sanding process, working my way all the way up to 220. I'll be adding my brand to this board, so to find center, I use a level as a straight edge and make a couple of diagonal lines to find the exact midpoint of the board. Once I have that, I dab the middle part of the board with a little bit of water and apply the branding iron to sear my logo into the back of the board. To finish off this board, I'll be using some mineral oil and some board conditioner. And if you're impressed with that logo on the board conditioner tin, you can thank this guy over here at Custom Grains. Chance is the guy that runs this company and he has recently transitioned from the corporate nine to five to pursue woodworking full-time and he was kind enough to fill an order for me for my own custom board conditioner that I can give those away as gifts for people who buy from my Etsy store. But Chance is making a run at this to make it a full-time career and he has all different kinds of cutting boards, charcuterie boards, corporate gifts, you name it, he's got it. So if you're interested in buying that kind of stuff, I'd encourage you to check him out. I'll leave a link to his website in the description below. So here's how the final cutting board turned out. I really like the coloring of the Paduke wood after it's been finished. Before it's finished, it's more of a fire crimson red. After you finish it, it's more of a dark mahogany burgundy red. And it really is a handsome color for a brick cutting board like you see here. Now, while I was making this Paduke board, I actually made another one made out of a darker color wood called Wingy, Wingy. Uh, the pronunciation of this is hotly debated, so I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's the darker color wood that you see here, which gives it a much different look. I think I still prefer the Paduke, but I'm interested to see what you think. Okay, that's gonna be it for this video. Remember, if you're interested in winning this board, the instructions for entering the contest are earlier in this video. I really want this to go to a good home, so make sure you enter, and I will see you on the next one.